an original MCM production. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our lecturer tonight. My name is Robert Smith. I'm the director of the Center for Urban Research, Teaching, and Outreach at Marquette University. Dr. Heather Ann Thompson is a historian at the University of Michigan, Go Blue, and is the Pulitzer Prize and Bancroft Prize winning author of Blood in the Water the Attica Prison Uprising of 1971 and its legacy. Blood in the Water was also a finalist for the National Book Award, and it won the Ridenour Prize, the J. Willard Hearst Prize, the Public Information Award from the New York Bar Association, and received a rarely given honorable mission for the Silver Gavel, Silver Gavel Award from the American Bar Association. Upon its release, Blood in the Water was prominently reviewed and profi profiled in the New York Times in four different sections. And Thompson herself was profiled in the highly coveted talk section of the New York Times Magazine. Blood in the Water ultimately landed on 14 best of 2016 lists, including the New York Times most notable books of the year, and ones published by Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, Newsweek, Christian Science Monitor, and the Boston Globe. The book also received rave reviews in over 100 top popular publications, and Thompson appeared in over 25 television shows, including PBS, NewsHour, CBS Sunday Morning, and The Daily Show, as well as over 15 radio programs, including Sirius and NPR. Dr. Thompson is a public intellectual who writes extensively on the history of policing, mass incarceration, and the current criminal justice system for the New York Times, Newsweek, Time, The Washington Post, Jacobin, The Atlantic, Salon, Dissent, NBC, New Labor, Forum, The Daily Beast, and The Huffington Post. On the policy front, Thompson served on a National Academy of Sciences Blue Ribbon panel that studied the causes and consequences of mass incarceration in the U.S. This two-year, $1.5 million project was sponsored by the National Institute of Justice and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Thompson has served as well on the boards of several policy organizations, including the Prison Policy Initiative, the Eastern State Penitentiary, a historic site, and on the advisory boards of Life of the Law and the Alliance of Families for Justice. She has also worked in an advisory capacity with the Center for Community Change, the Humanities Action Lab Global Dialogues on Incarceration, and the Open Society Foundation on issues related to her work. Thompson's audience is international as well as national. She has spent considerable time presenting her work on prisons and justice policy to universities and policy groups nationally and internationally, as well as to legislators in various states. She has given talks in countries such as France, Switzerland, Germany, Ireland, the UK, as well as across the United States, including Hawaii. But there's one other significant uh, point that I have to make about Heather Thompson that for many of us might trump all of these accolades that are uh, certainly prestigious. Heather Thompson is good people. Let me, let me say that one more time. Heather Thompson is good people. And for those of us who use that coupling of words, we know the significance of what it means by someone who we bestow that honor upon. As a native of Detroit, Michigan, as I bring her forward tonight, I can only greet her one way. What up, though? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Heather Ann Thompson.
<laughs> thank you, Rob, and thank you all for coming out to this incredible venue. This place is just stunning, especially from up here because I get to see the lights, although I feel like I'm, I'm so up high here. Can you all hear? Hear well? Okay, wonderful. Uh, I apologize, we had a little bit of technical difficulty, but I think we are good, and hopefully, hopefully the slides will, um, will animate the story that I want to tell you tonight, which is about the Attica prison uprising of 1971, and uh, why I think it's really important that we revisit this event that happened now 46 years ago uh, in a completely different state, uh, to people that we may not know, uh, you know, long, long ago. And I want to make the case for you tonight that this story really matters. Uh, and it matters to all of us in a way that we might not predict. And so what I want to do is, before I get into the nitty gritty of telling you about Attica, which I promised to do with some uh, really, I think, uh, really incredible slides, from the actual event. I first want to begin with uh, a little bit of uh, today, a little bit of kind of orienting us to why I think this is important. And so the first thing I want to do is to make the case that I think that Attica, if we understand what happened there 45 years ago, really helps us to understand where we are today. And what do I mean by where we are? Well, let's start with the fact that, and some of you uh, who are gracious enough to listen to me earlier today at the university, you know my, my mantra, which is that we have become the world's absolutely largest prison nation. And many of us know this, or at least we've read about it or heard about it, or you know, uh, sadly many of us have family on the inside. But I wanna really give us a sense of just what that means first. Just a little data, and then I'll get into the more of the storytelling. When I tell you that we are the world's largest prison nation, I wanna bring your attention to this top pink graph. And I know we can't see it that closely, but if you could see it closely, you'll notice a couple of things. First of all, the flat part of the graph is most of the 20th century, where the prison population in this country was consistent, constant, neither very high, neither very low, and then all of a sudden it goes through the roof. And those little gray boxes point to these moments when it particularly spiked upward. And one of the things that you would know if you could see it, <laughs> if it was not so far away, is that these were all intensely political decisions that led to this staggering leap in incarceration, much more so than what you would hope, which would be something like the crime rate. In fact, we began this war on crime, as you'll notice in the box on the bottom left, when the crime rate was really unremarkable, and in fact had not been that low since the 19-teens. So we began this war on crime for political reasons, very specifically really in response to the civil rights unrest in both the South and in the North, and then we doubled down. And you see in the box on the right that in fact one of the greatest ironies is that the violent crime rate, that very thing that we were being sold was the reason we were doing this, became catastrophic when we were knee deep in that war on crime. So first, I just want to point out that we are an international outlier, that, the, or, that this was historically unprecedented, and then to point out that we are an international outlier. This is us versus myriad other countries, and it actually wouldn't matter which countries I had up here, Russia, Rwanda, China, Denmark, Sweden, Britain, doesn't matter. We are a major international outlier, and in addition, and some of you have heard me already say this, so bear with me, we are also a severely racially disproportionate prison nation, where we lock up black and brown folks in numbers way, way disproportionate to their, pres to their presence in the population, and as importantly, disproportionate to who is actually committing the crimes. We, we see this particularly acutely in drug arrests. This is black versus Latino versus white drug arrests, and we see that it is just staggeringly higher for black and brown folks than white. And this is all while we know from the studies and the data that white folks both do more drugs and sell more drugs, more white folks, than anybody else. Again, so there's just something going on here that we have to explain. Part of the racialization we see has to do with where policing is. This graph shows the policing of marijuana in some of our major metropolitan areas. 
And you see that black folks are criminalized far more for the possession and sales of marijuana than anybody else. But here's the thing. We not only did this for no good reason, and it not only became one of the most racialized, disproportionate systems in the world, but it doesn't work. Prison conditions grew worse and worse, while also violence grew worse and worse in the most heavily incarcerated communities. Prison conditions became so bad on the outside, right when we were telling people that these were institutions that were gonna make us safer, bring people home and make them safer. There was myriad violence, myriad incidents of violence inside of the prison began to increase in addition to not solving the problem of public safety on the outside. All right, and to top it all off, and this will be the end of my little rant about this, it doesn't work. There's no other institution in this country that we, do, we throw this much money at with this high of a failure rate. By that I mean recidivism, by that I mean the trauma caused by being in prison creates more problems than it solves. So it doesn't work, it's, it's created when it wasn't needed, and it puts us as a severe international outlier. All right, that's all my quick introduction. Here's what really is why we're here tonight, because there's something that happens at Attica that is central to this. And very specifically, what we got wrong about what happened to Attica goes a long way to explaining why it was as a nation, not just that we started a war on crime, but why did we get so punitive? Why did we become a nation that was willing to lock up children for life? Why did we become a nation that was okay with solitary confinement indefinitely, or okay with 30, 40, 50 year sentences? That's what we have to explain, the punitiveness of our society. This next graph sets up the whole story, which is that this is that same graph I showed you about our uptick in prison population. But what it reveals, if we could zero in, is that it doesn't just go up in the 70s, or after the 60s, the prison population spikes very, very specifically after 1972. A marked increase, and then it just goes after. Higher, higher, higher. And that has everything to do with Attica. So now I'm gonna tell you the story of Attica, and then we can hopefully wrap it up so that we can have some great Q&A. This is the book I wrote, it's called Blood in the Water. And the story of writing this book is a story unto itself, and if we have time, I hope to share some of that with you. This was a journey. It took me 13 years to write this book. And uh, as, when I was on The Daily Show, Trevor Noah said, is that because you type like this? And I said, no, that's not the reason. Uh, the reason, you know, I was wondering, how could he make this a funny story? <laughs> but he broke the ice with that one. Um, the reality was, this was a story that the state of New York did not want told. And I didn't know that when I got the book contract. I didn't know that when I began it. And what I really didn't understand was what was at stake in this story. So this slide shows you a little bit of the behind the scenes drama. At the top left, you'll see a, a headline. It was 1976, and then governor of New York, Hugh Carey, essentially closed the book on Attica. That was to say, it's done. We're not gonna have any prosecutions. Everybody just needs to forget about Attica. Well, part of that forget about Attica was shutting down all the records related to Attica. And I was so naive, I didn't know anything about that. I said, I'm gonna write the book. Well, 13 years later, <laughs> I finally was able to write the book. I'll tell you that story if you're interested, but let me just say to you that one of the reasons why I'm able to share the story with you is because the survivors never stopped talking and also because I had a few amazing breaks, a little bit of cloak and dagger behind the scenes that allowed me to tell you the story. And I tell you that only to tell you that it's really a sad day when some of our most important events in American history require luck to be able to share them with the American public. So let me tell you what that story is and why it was important that I told it and why it was so important to them to shut it down. This is Attica, New York. This is actually the Attica prison. This is a tiny, tiny town in upstate New York, uh, minuscule, bucolic, 
gorgeous. You drive through it. There's a bandstand. There's a little league uh, mound. Uh, it's you know, it's it's just a slice of Americana. And then you just leave the outside of Attica, and this is what you see: a fortress, a maximum security facility built in Great Depression. And when I was there in 2004, it looked exactly as it did during the Great Depression. Uh, and for the men in there in 1971, it looked exactly like it was built in the Great Depression. And guess what? It's still an operational prison to this day, still a maximum security facility. And inside of this facility were 2,400 men, overwhelmingly from cities, uh, the boroughs of New York City, New York, uh, Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, overwhelmingly black and brown men, severely overcrowded, having a terrible existence in this prison beyond what they had been sentenced to, because often people will say, well, what did you expect, a country club? No, just some basic human rights. So these were men being fed on 63 cents a day. These are men were given one square of toilet paper a day one shower if they were lucky uh, every week, more like often every month. These are men who had not enough money for their basic necessities, which led to all kinds of shady behavior, just trying to basically survive. These are men with, uh, if, they, if they were not married to the mother of their children, they could not see their own children. Uh, parole rules that were so capricious, you could get parole at Attica, but then management would hand you an out-of-date phone book and basically tell you to write a letter to a local employer, and you couldn't get out until he hired you. Well, needless to say, not too many employers were eager to hire anybody with a postmark of Attica, New York, uh, not to mention the fact that it cost money to get stamps and paper, and money was one thing that these guys did not have. So this was just an example of the grinding, grinding conditions in addition to uh, racial threats and racism behind the walls, because the other group in this prison were an all-white guard force. And before I throw them under the bus, because actually they play a very important role in my story, these were often these young white kids from upstate New York with no other job possibilities but to work in a prison, very poorly trained, themselves scared because they were constantly being put in these situations in an overcrowded prison without the, with the sufficient resources to feel safe or to run a humane institution. So this place was a mess. On the, on, the, on the eve of what will become one of the most incredible human rights struggles in American history, the guards are in a union meeting. They're telling their union reps, this is, a, this is not safe. Do something. We need more training. We need more help. We need more guards on the job. And the prisoners, in the most incredible faith, of this country. They actually believe in the democracy of this country. They're writing letters to their state senator and to the, to the head of corrections, basically begging for basic conditions to be improved. And guess what? Nobody's listening. Prison management isn't listening to the guards union. State senators and the corrections department is not listening to the guys inside begging for help. And so, needless to say, this is in fact a tinderbox that is going to be eager to explode with just the slightest, slightest thing to set it off. And that thing came on September 9th, 1971. Believe it or not, uh, a complete accident, really, one caused by prison management. Um, I won't bore you with the details. It's all in the book, sort of blow by blow. But basically, management makes a decision to lock some prisoners coming back from breakfast in this hallway. They don't manage to tell the guards what they're going to do. They don't tell the prisoners why they're being locked in. And needless to say, panic sets in when everybody feels trapped in this hallway. People begin backing away from each other, arming themselves with anything they can find. And in that sheer panic and fear and chaos, a gate that had a faulty weld in it that people had complained about manages to open. And in that moment, it is complete chaos. This picture, you might be interested to know, came from that time. This is a legit picture, including the picture of the calendar, uh, September 9th, 1971. This, I would characterize as a prison riot. And I use that word really carefully. Chaos, fear, people being beaten up, 
hostages being taken, uh, you know, civilian and guard hostages, uh, people being injured, guards and prisoners alike. And this was a pretty horrific moment. But out of that, and for really interesting reasons having to do with, largely having to do with the prisoners' long-standing discussions about the need to improve their conditions, thus then began one of the most extraordinary human rights protests in American history. These men moved to one of the four exercise yards farthest away from the front of the prison and began to get organized in one of the most incredible democratic protests we've seen. The prisoners elected people to speak for them out of each of the cell blocks. They understood the importance of bringing the media in because one of the reasons why prisons are allowed to be the hell holes that they were then and remain today is because we are shut out of them and the media is shut out of them. So they invited the media in to see what conditions were like, but also, hopefully, to oversee negotiations. The hostages they had taken, as I said, both guards and civilian hostages, they surrounded by two rings of prisoners facing outward to make sure that they were protected, gave them mattresses, gave them food. And then they set up a medical tent, they set up a food distribution tent. Again, they were inviting the media in. And they made sure that people on the outside were being told what was happening. And what was happening was, we want to negotiate with the state of New York for improvements to our conditions. So on the outside, of course, people are terrified. These are family members of the guards, family members of the prisoners but they're hopeful that maybe something good can come of this. To assist something good in coming of this, the prisoners ask for some high-powered observers to come in to help them with this, in these negotiations with the state. You may recognize some of these people. On the far right is Tom Wicker of the New York Times, a very, uh, very well-known columnist who had written some sympathetic op-eds uh, for sympathetic to prisoner rights. In the middle, William Kunstler, Bill Kunstler, famed civil rights lawyer. On the left, Clarence Jones, who was the editor of the Amsterdam News. Um, but it wasn't just kind of radicals and liberals and lefties on this uh, observer's panel. The, the governor's office put you know, Republican State Senator John Dunn, and actually quite a few Republicans were on this panel. And in total, there was about 36 observers. And then became an extraordinary experiment, again, in democracy. For four long days and nights, these people negotiated with the state of New York. The observers would come in to help make sure, again, why were they there? Because the prisoners didn't trust the state of New York to bargain in good faith. And why did the state want them there? Because they were hoping that somehow they would talk these prisoners into surrendering. But for four long days and nights, these negotiations went on. I mean around the clock. You'll see in the top left picture, uh, the gentleman in the bottom left of that picture is Russell Oswald. He was the commissioner of corrections and he was there in the yard negotiating with these guys. I want to call your attention in that same photograph to the gentleman with the dark sunglasses on. His name was Big Black, and remember him, because I'm going to come back to him. Also, L.D. Barkley was standing next to him. He's the tall, skinny kid. He had these granny glasses on. And, you know, L.D. was 21 years old. He was there on a parole violation. There were a whole lot of young kids on there. He was there because he was caught driving without a driver's license. And there's a whole lot of people in there that you would not expect to be in Attica, much like people that are in prison today. So these negotiations went on and went on. But meanwhile, and this is really important, during those same four days and four nights, this is what was happening outside of the prison. Every state police barrack from around upstate New York was descending on Attica, New York. Every corrections officer from prisons across the state of New York who were not on duty were descending on upstate New York. And what was happening? For the same four days and four nights that these guys were negotiating, these prison, office, prison corrections officers and state troopers were getting angrier and angrier and angrier. And they were being fueled on this diet of rumor and innuendo. I was able to find the FBI documents 
that showed that the FBI was on the scene basically planting these lies that the prisoners were committing atrocities on the inside of the prison, getting these guys so fired up. And in fact, they were passing out weapons like candy indiscriminately. People were state issue weapons, their own weapons, passing out ammunition outlawed by the Geneva Convention. And nobody's writing down serial numbers. Nobody's following protocol. In fact, this one officer who's you know, trying, you know, mis you know, officer so-and-so took this gun out. He's trying to write it all down. He's basically told to rip it up. These guys are itching to get inside, and the observers can see this. And they know that this has got to be settled peacefully because this is going to be very ugly if it's not. And there's one reason why they know this more than ever midway through the negotiations. Remember that riot I was telling you about, that complete chaos of the first day? There was a young man named William Quinn, a guard, who was in the center of that prison when that gate came open. And he was trampled and overrun by so many men who were also taking kicks and hits at him. Midway through the negotiation, he dies of his injuries. And this is after the prisoners try to get him out to get medical care. This is after he's been in the hospital, but he dies in the most horrific, tragic death from being beaten. And when he dies, it's a game changer because the prisoners, in addition to the other demands, have another one that's really, really important now, and it is the demand for amnesty because they want to know that if they surrender, that they will not all be indiscriminately charged with felony murder, and they want to know that they will not be harmed physically if they surrender. So amnesty becomes the sticking point in the negotiations. And everybody is recommending, including the Republican state senators and the Democrats on the, and the, the, the lefties on the, they're all saying, Governor, you got to give these people amnesty because we've got 40 state employees in there whose lives depend upon it. Let them find a way that they can surrender. Endorse their demands. So it's going nowhere. So the observers call the governor. And who was he? Nelson Rockefeller. Many of you know him as the liberal Republican of this time period with a very good reputation. But Rockefeller was a deeply politically ambitious man, and his own party had moved severely rightward. Nixon was now the president, much to the irritation of uh, Rockefeller. And Attica was going to be that moment where he got to show he was tough on crime. He wasn't going to budge for any prisoner. And so when the observers said, please come to Attica, you don't have to go inside the yard, but you need to step outside of that prison and you need to assure them that they can surrender without being harmed, that there will not be indiscriminate prosecutions, and most importantly, that you will stand by the demands, that you will allow them to surrender. And he said, no, he's not coming. And there had been other examples of governors having come, and even mayors having come to prison rebellions to try to make things settle peacefully. So then the observers set this telegram out, basically to the American people. And they, as you can read, minced no words. They basically said, if the governor does not come, there's going to be a massacre, because they could see what nobody else could see, which is this. Again, the weaponry being passed out, the fury, the anger. What my book revealed and this was part of the smoking gun documents that I was able to find, was that the governor had no intention of ever settling peacefully with these prisoners. And there's a whole behind the scenes story here that I could share with you, but here's the bottom line. They were gonna take this prison by force. And they didn't bring in the National Guard, by the way, who had been trained in prison retaking, they brought in the guards and the troopers who were not only not trained, but who were about as angry and fired up as they could be. So let me just paint a picture for you. It is now the fifth morning of this uprising, and it is cold and rainy and chilly. It is September in upstate New York. And it's early in the morning, and the prisoners think that negotiations are still in play. My research revealed that one of the reasons they think this is that the, that the government of New York very deliberately wanted them to think that. This was another big reveal because for years later they told us 
that they had given these guys a chance to surrender. They knew what was coming. No, no, no. There was this express plan to not let them know what was coming. So they think negotiations are still in play. People are getting up in the morning. You know, they're bringing food to the hostages. They're waiting for the observers to come back in. And then they, some of them start to get a little nervous because the observers have not come back in that morning. And they're met at the gate by the commissioner who basically says, you know, what he'd said every morning of every day, which is you need to surrender, you need to get rid of the hostages, we need to end it today, but they'd said that every day. And the prisoners respectfully said, no, we're not gonna, <laughs> we're gonna continue these negotiations until we resolve this. And then all of a sudden they heard the sound of a helicopter outside. And here's the thing about the faith in this country, which I find so, I found so humbling even, re, even writing this book. Some of the men, not a few of the men on the inside, think that Rockefeller's coming. They hear this helicopter and there's a bit of a moment of elation because they think finally this is gonna end. Finally, the governor is gonna come and settle this thing. The more savvy of them know though that this is not a good sign. And as, and as the minutes tick by, and as especially they realize that they've not seen any of the observers, then panic sets in. And they decide to implement a plan that had been talked about. In fact, some of the hostages knew about this plan, but it, man, it was the last ditched plan that could have been implemented. And that was to take some of the hostages up onto the catwalks that, that that sat over on top of these yard, uh, of the yards and to take some hostages up there and to surround each of them with the executioners, quote unquote, which was in fact prisoners with homemade weapons to kind of suggest to the government, don't come in, right? Like, hold, don't come in, because if you come in, you're jeopardizing the lives of your own people, right? They, they were all hoping against hope that the lives of the state employees would matter enough that at least they would back off and continue negotiations. In my book, I take you up onto this catwalk and I take you, for example, right in this moment where one of the guards by the name of Mike Smith, 24 years old, white kid from upstate New York who actually was a pretty decent guy. In fact, he had actually encouraged some of the prisoners in the metal shop that he oversaw, that, you know, you got some pretty decent demands. Write a letter to the, you know, write a letter to the state senator. You know, what you want seems pretty reasonable. And he's up there on the catwalk. And next to him is Don Noble, who's one of the prisoners he worked with in the metal shop. And they are terrified. They are shaking. They are sick to their stomach. Because frankly, nobody at this point has a lot of faith that the lives of the state's employees are gonna be worth anything if what's really at stake is standing up to the prisoners. And so they're up on the catwalk and I take you into their discussion where, for example, Mike had managed to get a pen and he'd written a little note and he'd secured it deep in his pocket to his wife, Sharon. And he said to Don, you know, Don, if you get out of here and I don't, can you please tell Sharon that I love her? And Don's like, yeah, you know, I, I will, man. And, you know, and then he shares his information with Mike and they're both just like, how did it come to this? You know, how, how, how are we here? And no sooner do they finish this conversation and every man up there is terrified, they hear the sound of another helicopter. And Mike tells you in the book about how that helicopter was so big that you could actually feel the concussion in your chest. And these, they are, as I said, terrified. And right at that moment, all of a sudden this helicopter starts dropping canisters of CN and CS gas on the yard. Now, you've all heard of tear gas and some of you have had the misfortune to experience tear gas, perhaps in a protest. But gas is a bit of a misnomer because actually CN and CS gas is a powder. And when these canisters explode, it's a powder that gets in people's mucous membranes, inside of their eyes, in their nose, down their throat. And so when this gas is dropped, 
and you can see this in the film because yes, the state police are filming all of this. The gas comes down and it mows everybody down. And as they are retching, they are vomiting, they are blinded, they are on the ground. That is when the ground assault begins. 300 troopers, these ones who are so heavily armed, some of them two, three guns with gas masks on, m go out onto the catwalks and start shooting everything in their wake. And for 15 minutes, you can hear on the film the helicopter circling overhead, intoning again and again and again, surrender with your hands up and you won't be harmed. Surrender with your hands up and you won't be harmed. And all you can hear simultaneously is da 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 Needless to say, it was utter carnage. 39 men, both prisoners and hostages, lay dead or dying. A total of 128 men were shot so severely, some of them six, seven bullet wounds. And here's the thing. That is not at all what the American public was told had just happened. In fact, 15 minutes after this assault, government officials stand outside of the prison. And who's outside of the prison? Because this is really important. The New York Times, the LA Times, the AP. The AP is really critical, right? Because the AP is the body that every small town newspaper was getting its news from. And it said something totally different had happened. The prisoners had killed the hostages. Not only had they killed the hostages, they had slit their throats. They had tortured them. One of them, they said, had even been castrated. And his testicles had been shoved in his mouth. And they knew who did it. They'd even seen it with their own eyes. There was even film of it. And by the way, the person they said had done it, remember that guy with the sunglasses, Big Black? That's who they said did it. And the one that they had said had been castrated, Mike Smith, the one that was up there terrified, you should know, I'm jumping ahead in the story, but Mike Smith had been shot four times across the abdomen in precision by a fellow corrections officer for daring to side with the prisoners. But that's not what the American public knew. And so this headline, that the prisoners had in fact been responsible for the carnage at Attica went out. This is the front page of the New York Times. It reflects a barbarism wholly alien to civilized society. Prisoners slashed the throats of utterly helpless, unarmed guards whom they held captive through the around-the-clock negotiations in what the inmates held out for increasingly revolutionary set of demands. This was the front page of the New York Times. This was the front page of the LA Times. And like I said, every newspaper in between. Because you know that the press did not even stop to ask for corroboration. They heard a story about black prisoners castrating white guards, and that's all they needed to hear. And it was a front page story. In fact, what was going on, however, in Attica was a horror show that the world had no clue was happening. The men in Attica were stripped. They were forced to run gauntlets. They were forced, remember, every window has been shot out. There's glass everywhere. They are forced to crawl over this glass, run over this glass. And by the way, Nixon has one question, and only really one important question to ask Rockefeller when Rockefeller calls. After congratulating him, he says, was this a black business? And Rockefeller basically says, why, yes, Mr. President, it was. And that's all he needed to know. But you can see from this visual that it was by no means only a black business. It was a human business. And Big Black is the one laying on the top right slide. And he's there for hours and hours and hours while he is tortured. He has a football under his neck. They tell him that if he drops this football, they're going to shoot him in the head. And they have, he has every reason to believe them because he has seen people assassinated. The bottom picture you have, you might ask yourself, why do I have these pictures? These are pictures that the state troopers took. Consider them like lynching photography. Consider them like trophy photography. And these photographs were denied for years too. 
But the bottom photograph was after he had been tortured for many hours. Both of his wrists are broken. This is the beginning of his ordeal because he's about ready to be put in even more torture in segregation. American public doesn't hear anything about this. In fact, state legislators see this beating go on and they think it's justified because these are the animals that had castrated Mike Smith. Nobody does anything, nobody says anything. And meanwhile, the hostages and their families are also getting screwed over by the state of New York. These are families in upstate New York, many of them single bread winner families. The husband is the guard, the wife is home, often with lots of children. And as they are burying their husbands and brothers and sons who work in the corrections department, or as some of these hostages are recovering in the hospital from their gunshot wounds, the state of New York sends officials to their house. This was another thing I found out and was able to tell you about in the book. Sends them to their house and says, you know, Mrs. Cunningham, here's a little check to tide you over. Mrs. Cunningham had eight children. Here's a little, you know, we know you need to buy groceries and, or if someone, you know, John Stockholm getting better in the hospital, you know, here, Johnny, you know, here's some money, tide your family over and we're here for you, take the time you need. And they never told them what they knew they were doing, which was anybody that cashed one of those checks under New York state law was electing a remedy which meant that they were forever forbidden from suing the state of New York for the death of their loved ones. But again, the state of New York doesn't tell anybody anything. And so you'd think, well, maybe someone's telling the truth. And some people were. There's some heroes in this story. There was a coroner who could very plainly see that everybody there had been shot to death, that nobody had had their throats slashed. And he tries to tell the truth, and the Rockefeller administration, even though he had voted, you know, he'd supported Goldwater, they try to say he's a communist, they try to discredit him, they bring in two more coroners. But eventually the story is corrected, but nobody believes it. By then it's too late. In fact, to this day, in upstate New York, if you ask who killed the prisoners, I mean, I'm sorry, who killed the hostages, plenty of people will tell you it was the prisoners. And so we had to rely on something else, which was a series of investigations. And the investigations ran the gamut. There was a citizen's investigation called the McKay Commission, which is pretty good. But of course, they could only report what they could see in the state of New York, as my book will make clear. You know, a third of the book is about the uprising, and two thirds is about the cover up, because that became the most incredible story to me. They could only tell what they could see, and what they could see was not very much. And so then there was congressional investigations, and there was a Justice Department investigation, which incredibly found no civil rights violations, even though they had doctors reporting the horrors that they were seeing inside of that prison. So it all hinged ultimately on the state of New York's own investigation, put together by none other than Nelson Rockefeller. And he decided to run it out of the Organized Crime Task Force Unit, which was the mob unit, because he wanted to show that this was a lefty conspiracy. And he allowed, and this is really incredible, the same state troopers who had been in charge of the retaking were the ones in charge of the investigation. So needless to say, no chalk markings were made of any bodies. No ballistics were collected. In fact, everything that was collected was meant to show prisoner guilt, and anything else was scooped up and literally buried behind the prison in a big hole. And this investigation goes on, and ultimately, after essentially threatening so many prisoners with indictment if they didn't cooperate, and parole, giving them parole if they did cooperate, the state manages to ultimately to indict 62 men inside of Attica for riot-related crimes and not one member of law enforcement. My book will tell you how that happened. For example, you will learn that right after Attica, and this was another one of those incredible documents I found, it turns out that Rockefeller is having a series of secret meetings in his estate, and I can't make this stuff up, in the pool house, with the head of the state police, the attorney general, essentially the architects of this retaking become the architects of the cover-up. 
And so what do you all see, the American public? First, you've seen the headlines that the prisoners have killed all the people inside. Then, for the next years, you see black and brown prisoners being paraded in and out of courtrooms in upstate New York, sending the not-so-subtle message that everything that's wrong with American prisons is the people inside of them, the prisoners. Now, I don't have time tonight because I want to wrap this up and give us time for discussion to tell you that this is an amazing story of one of the most incredible legal defense efforts in American history. The state does not succeed in railroading these guys. There is young law students and lawyers that descend on upstate New York and begin one of the most incredible legal defense efforts in American history. It's up there with the Scottsboro Boys defense. And so for those of you who are interested in law, there's a lot of that courtroom drama in this book and also this, the strategies that young people, they lived in communal houses, they, they did a jury project, they, they got the community to know what was going on. But I want to leave you with not just that little bit of optimism that comes out of this book, but another one. As much as this is a story of repression, and it is, because I suggest to you in the book that if we want to understand why we became a nation that was so punitive, we have to understand how critical events like Attica were sold to us. Do you know that on the eve of Attica, most Americans polled were against the death penalty? Most believed that prisoners deserved human rights. We were already moving towards community corrections and decarceration. Within three years of Attica polling data, it was a complete flip. Everybody wants the death penalty. Everybody thinks prisoners are animals. And we have one of the worst backlashes to prisoner rights and civil rights in human history. This is a story of repression. However, it is also an extraordinary David and Goliath story of resistance. This is Big Black. This is the one that was on that table. And he never stopped telling his story. And despite the efforts of the state of New York to shut him down, for 30 years, the prisoners stuck to it and eventually had their day in court with the state of New York. Two jury trials awarded them a massive amount of damages. Now, that wasn't the end of the story. The state of New York, the appeals court, took it all away sent them all back to the drawing board. But there were some heroes that eventually helped them to settle their case. But here's the point, they never gave up. And it was their ability to keep saying, we were tortured, we were traumatized. And the state said, no, they weren't. Worst that ever happened to them was the fraternity hazing. But they kept telling their stories. And so did the guard hostages. They too kept telling their stories. Because one of the most amazing human stories in the Attica history is the way in which people across class lines and race lines began to understand the way in which they had all been dispensable when it came to this march to power of people like Nelson Rockefeller and when it came to building prisons in America. So ultimately, I leave you in the book with this, which is that no matter how repressive prisons were in 71, or became, because actually Attica is worse today than it was in 71. The thing about prison is that it is filled with human beings. And ultimately, they will never stop being human, no matter what the apparatus is that says otherwise. And so the ultimate punchline of this book is about resistance, not repression. And indeed, as this book came out, which was a year ago, and literally the week that it came out, prisoners across this country stood up in a rebellion uh, on the anniversary of the original Attica Rebellion, and we've been seeing numerous of those ever since. And so there's so much to talk about here, about the research, about the cover-up, about the resistance, and about the repression. But the last thing I want to leave you with is the call for the importance of history. When we don't get our history right, when we let the people in charge of things tell us what happened, we do so at great peril. In the 1960s, virtually every bit of the horrific violence that was going on in this country was state violence. Kent State, Wounded Knee, Orangeburg, Jackson State, the Democratic National Convention of 68, and I could go on and on and on. And somehow, 
the American public came out of that period and said, hippies are dangerous, students are dangerous, civil rights is dangerous, prisoners are dangerous, Indians are dangerous, Chicanos are dangerous, and so what do we need? We need more police. We need fewer civil liberties. We need a bigger police state. And the fact that that is what the message was is one of the greatest ironies of the 20th century, and we have to explain it. That's what I do as a historian, and I think that what, one of the clearest answers that comes out of Attica is that we let other people tell us that history and tell us those narratives, and so it's time that we get the history right so we can get the future right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before we go into the Q&A, I was just going to say a few things and also a few things. I hope you can see the standing ovation in the crowd, which is well deserved. So what a powerful speech and uh, 13 or 14 years of diligent uh, work, well deserved. Uh, my name is Art Heitzer, I'm president of the Milwaukee Turners and I just wanna briefly uh, give you an interlude. I see a very famous uh, filmmaker waving, uh, Brad, uh, uh, who did a wonderful film on Attica, The Ghost of Attica. Uh, just wanna uh, welcome you all uh, and explain that uh, the reason Milwaukee Turners has initiated this, uh, not only this lecture, but uh, six programs, this is the last one of this segment, called Confronting Mass Incarceration, is because for 150 some years, we have stood for the progressive uh, ideals of um, the middle of the 19th century in Europe, the, the Turner Movement in Germany, which was uh, instrumental in terms of the settlement of Europeans in places like Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, we are committed to moving forward and supporting the notion of cutting back the number of imprisoned people in Wisconsin by at least 50% in the next 10 years. And we, of course, are not the first people who thought of this. Wisdom and Micah has been working on this for a number of years as well. But we need, and they deserve tremendous applause, but we all need support. So um, you will see, uh, if you haven't given your contact information and if you're interested, please make sure and sign in. There's literature and tables on the back. You will be given the opportunity to make financial contributions. This uh, six-part series was not free by any means, and there's a tremendous amount more work to be done. Uh, I'll just say another word or two about the Turners. If you came up from the landing, you might have seen kind of a monument thing on, uh, halfway up uh, in German. So in 1911, at the same time that the Robert E. Lee Jim Crow statues were going up around the South to celebrate the reversal of Reconstruction, uh, the Milwaukee Turners put up our monument to 26 of our members who gave their lives to end chattel slavery and to defend the, civil war, the Union of the Civil War. And uh, I, I do want to thank Julie Kohler, our vice president, who initiated this, this series. Of course, our partner, Boswell Books, and you know there's a book table on the left in the back. Uh, and there's books for all the three books that were part of the series, there's copies of those. Uh, so please check that out. Um, and among the other uh, cohorts in the movement to confronting mass incarceration, very essential groups have been the Filmers, Old Cheney uh, Advisory Board, Expo, which is ex-prisoners organizing a very dynamic and critical organization. The Wisconsin Justice Initiative, Wisdom and Micah, as I mentioned, are the forerunners of, of this movement. Citizen Action is a full-time organizer dealing with mass incarceration and mental health. The Milwaukee Mental Health Task Force. Of course, the ACLU has been very active on these issues for years. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we want and welcome your support. 
And this lecture tonight is also uh, in cooperation with the Zeidler, Frank P. Zeidler Memorial Lecture Committee, of which the Milwaukee Turners and all the other organizations that Frank was an active member of are, are active in. And I'm going to end my talk and just to introduce our board member from Turner's, a professor of history at UWM, who's going to speak for a few minutes on behalf of the Frank P. Zeidler Memorial Lecture Committee. Thank you very much. Th thank you very much. And Professor Thompson, I know, is very anxious to, to answer your, your, your questions, so I will be very brief. Um, so, um, and as our president, Art Heitzer, uh, uh, noted uh, this lecture um, is part of the Frank P. Zeidler Memorial uh, Lecture Series. And the, the lecture series was created, the first lecture was created, um, the lecture series was initiated in 2008 with the purpose of celebrating the life, ideals, and work of one of Milwaukee's greatest public citizens, Frank P. Zeidler, who served as mayor of Milwaukee from 1948 to 1960. As a citizen socialist, public official and activist in numerous religious, community, and civic organizations, Frank Zeidler devoted his life to the causes of peace, democracy, economic progress, and a clean en environment. Um, on behalf of the lecture committee, I would like to thank uh, the Milwaukee Turners uh, for hosting this year's lecture um, and all the partner organizations um, whom Art mentioned previously, as well as Boswell Books, and um, our longtime partners, the International Institute of Wisconsin, the Milwaukee Public Library, Milwaukee Public Television, and the Frank Zeidler Center uh, for Public uh, Discussion. And special thanks to, to Anita Zeidler and Tom Heinen of the Interfaith Conference of Greater Milwaukee. Um, I also really want to thank um, uh, my colleague and my friend, uh, Professor Robert Smith, um, who did a wonderful, such a wonderful job of, of introducing um, <laughs> Professor Thompson. Um, Professor Smith is Harry G. John, Professor of History and Director of the Center for Urban Research uh, at Marquette University. Um, and I can't think of a more fitting uh, speaker for this lecture series than Professor Thompson, who I return to you now. Uh, please uh, come up to the microphone and ask your questions. Thank you so much. My name is Philip Blank. I just want to mention that this lecture series started as the 60th anniversary of the Milwaukee Public Enterprise Committee, mm -hmm. which Frank co-founded. Mm -hmm. But my question is this. Are we not having problems because of corruption and the perversion of capitalism? I mean, when private prisons started, there were corrupt judges that were helping these people make a lot of money. I would suggest that the people who say government is bad, when they get in power, they prove it. <laughs> but are we not failing to recognize the idea of the, the common good, which Frank Zeidler and his recent, the first female attorney in the, she died, we celebrated her, her life a week ago last mm -hmm. Sunday. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's my question. Okay. Take a few more and then we... Hi, um, I lived in Rochester and Buffalo for seven years during this time, mm. and I actually had a friend in Attica, Eddie Lashour, I think yep, you've yep. met him. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna thank you for your work, and I think my question is really, when we show up, pay attention, we speak our truth, as you certainly are. How do you let go of the outcome so that you can show up again and do the good work we need to do? Mm. Mm. Um, I want to thank you for talking about September 9th of last year uh, at the end of your speech. I think it's really important. And the article that you wrote about the Vaughan uprising. Um, I'm just wondering if you can kind of talk about and do like some comparison between mm -hmm. Attica and some of these other uprisings, specifically around like the public awareness that mm -hmm. comes afterward and the, the narratives. Mm, great questions and comments. Um, I, I, first, I want to say, you know, to, the, to, the, to your first comment about the, 
you know, about government and about the common good. And I think that that is the core that we, we lose, right? We, once we privatize not just prisons, but all the services that go into prisons, once we, once we attach a profit motive to uh, human misery, and by human misery, I mean both those who are victimized and those who are victimized by crime and those who are victimized on the inside by too long of prison sentences. And once that becomes connected to profit, uh, we lose our way at, at, every, at every level. Um, but the thing about the Attica uprising is that's why I leave it at the end of the book not about repression. Because one of the most extraordinary things about this story, and it was humbling to me, frankly, is that people with the least reason to be optimistic, and maybe this even connects to the final question, the least reason to believe that you should show up or that, you should, that there's anything to hope for, um, stood together. Um, these were men who uh, were otherwise divided by everything from religion to political persuasion to racial identity to, I mean, you name it. And uh, they saw that we were all human beings and that very principle kind of guided them, not just for a year, not just for three months, not just for two years, but in some of these cases, really for 30 years to just keep showing up and telling the truth. And so I think for those people, it behooves all of us to hear what they had to say and to, uh, you know, and to continue truth telling today, which, you know, leads to the question about what happened last year. You know, many of us don't realize that last year, um, an estimated 24,000, and frankly, we don't know how many, because we can't get inside, uh, human beings inside of prenal facilities, men and women, uh, protested and stood up for the exact same things they stood up for in 1971 overcrowding, inhumane conditions, abuse of guards, and, um, and they were shut down, uh, you know, not quite as badly as they were shut down at Attica, but frankly, we don't know how badly because we haven't shown up for them. Nobody was banging down the doors uh, kind of en masse in these prisons to say what's happening to these people once they dared to protest. Some did, your organization did, but, but in general, we as citizens did not. And um, so, you know, part of the, my goal anyway in telling the story is to remind us that terrible things happen behind closed doors. And when the people inside take every imaginable risk and try to tell us that something terrible is happening inside and end up in the hole for it and end up beaten for it and end up killed for it because some people have been killed for it, um, we, it's time for us to start listening and demand access to these public institutions that we pay for, that, that are done in our name, that take all of our resources away from everything else that we think is important, and yet we just say, do what you want. Do what you want. We don't care, do what you want. And that's what this organization, you know, and thank you, Julie, for you know, bringing us all together here tonight. Thank you to the Turners and, you know, the Lecture Foundation. I mean, this is the point of this, to, to get people to start, to start saying, these are, our, these are our institutions, shut it down, make it better, and um, stop that corruption you're talking about. Uh, if there's anyone else who wants to ask a question, we have a few more minutes, but uh, having the, find a microphone in my hand, I'm gonna, ask two intertwined questions. <clears throat> so we know, for instance, in California that the Union of the Prisoner Guards is a very powerful force and probably on the other side. So I'm wondering if you could, one, uh, identify who our friends and foes are in the whole issue of mass incarceration generally. Mm -hmm. And secondly, in Wisconsin, we often talk, you know, I mentioned we're trying to cut the prison population in half that would be cutting Wisconsin's over incarceration rate down to the same rate in our sister state of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So why or what would it be in a state like Minnesota, for, as one example, that has a vision maybe, and maybe even Texas, some of those places that we don't have any lessons or comments? Thank Great you. question. And I was ask, going to ask the same kind of a question, is do you have, the, have other examples of other countries or other states mm -hmm. that really have been able to penetrate into what's going on behind the doors? Can we do it by legislation? Can we do it by citizen action? 
how does it happen? Mm -hmm. Do we tie it to the money motive and say we're paying too much money as taxpayers? How can it be done? Mm -hmm. Give us some more hope. <laughs> Well, before, before I take a third question, because these are big ones, let me, before I lose my own train of thought, um, these are great questions. Let me just first say about prison guard unions, because this comes up a lot, and I think that I'm, I really thank you for that question. Um, it is true that some prison guard unions, and for particularly in the 1980s, the California Peace Officers Association was one of those unions that played a devastating role uh, in terms of helping mass incarceration, that is to say, passing devastating legislation like three strikes laws and truth and sentencing. But I think it is a terrible mistake if we throw the labor movement under the bus as we move forward. Uh, you know, I, I, I know this is not necessarily popular in some circles where I go speak, but I did some talks for the, you know, with the AFL-CIO, and my message is very clear. This is a working class issue at every level. Uh, people that work in these prisons are having horrendous conditions. Uh, they, they are also being exploited. And if we decide that it's us against them, I think we're in real trouble. Most guard union op members, they don't want to work in a prison, they just want to work. And until we are cognizant of what the real issues are, we are going to be pitting some of our most important allies against each other. That's number one. Number two, we can't blame guard unions for mass incarceration because some of the most heavily incarcerated states, like Texas and Louisiana, there ain't a guard union to be found. So we got to be really clear here before people before working people or unemployed people are pitted against each other who the enemy is. So I think those are potential allies. Um, the, the, what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry, guard unions? Well, I was just talking about the Minnesota, Wisconsin example. Minnesota, Wisconsin. Look, I mean, every state has a different culture and every state has a different political history that kind of leads to its outcomes. But I just say that rather than kind of say, well, what did they do that we didn't do? You have to take your own state's culture as it is and motivate and mobilize there. So some states, to your question, Julie, some of them have been quite remarkable in uh, humanizing what's happening in the corrections, and some have not been so successful. I will tell you that one of the things that's been most successful is, again, when community organizing matches legislative activism. You can't do one without the other. Laws won't pass without people in the streets demanding them, and people won't come out in the streets and just demand it unless somebody is responding to it legislatively. So it's that magic sweet spot of both, and frankly, uh, the critical role of formerly incarcerated people in the movement. I mean, as Milwaukee moves forward, formerly incarcerated people have to be front and center in whatever you do because they know what the system is better than anybody. And rather than play a you know, peripheral role or just show up sometimes or be trotted out sometimes, you know, the success of states like New York, for example, rolling back a lot of incarceration was because they have really strong organizations of formerly incarcerated people. Um, and by the way, that's also true in other countries. If we look at other countries with more progressive uh, criminal justice law, it's because prisoners themselves have more power, more human rights, more ability to speak, the ability to write, the ability to publish, the ability to be heard. Um, so I think that's something we all as advocates need to keep front and center. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. If Frank Seidler were here, he would say, look at the windows that we have here at Turner Hall. They tell us what it's about, liberty, mm -hmm. tolerance, justice. And he also would say, would you speak about public schools? Because that was a big concern yes. for him. Public schools, he said, is the base of our democracy. Mm -hmm. And democracy is the base of our freedom. And if we lose the public schools that takes all, we're go not going to have the kind of situation that we want. I thank you so much for saying that and really reminding us of that because sometimes, particularly when we start to work in the criminal justice reform world, and we spend a lot of energy on things like cutting prison population, which by the way, right on and as we should, we forget about the other half of that puzzle, which was what do we do instead? 
What, what is it that stop, what is it that actually makes communities safer? What is it that actually brings communities together? And public education is the core of that, so much so that we know, we know that if somebody doesn't graduate from high school, their chances of being incarcerated are just exponentially increased, and we know that that is true with public safety. Education is our best, you know, well, education, of course, and housing and shelter, and, but, the, but we, we can't lose sight of that in any, moment, in any movement to decarcerate, which is what is the alternative? We know what works, and we just, you know, we have to think about the people who knew it and remind us ourselves of what they said, so thank you for that. So we've got just a few more minutes, so we'll take these I'll three. I'll take the, the next three so everyone and, gets a chance to talk. Yes, thank you. Well, I'd like you to speak about the influence of George Jackson and mm. his book, Soledad Brother and Blood in My Eye, mm -hmm. and the upheaval in California prisons at that time, mm -hmm. the um, assassination of George Jackson, the attempt of his brother Jonathan Jackson to free him from jail, the death of the judge when Jonathan Jackson attempted that, the persecution of Angela Davis and other Black Panthers. Okay, great. Hi, thank you very much. This may be a little too much after this, so if you want to talk about this later sometime, that's fine. But um, yesterday at the panel, you mentioned the four, your state being having, unfortunately, famous for having the most um, children yep. sentenced to life. And um, I come from the world of science and medicine, and I'm sure you've heard the saying that the law lacks way behind science and technology. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of concerns of seeing um, well, I guess twofold. One, the way the science is used mm -hmm. to uh, convict people. The labs, the FBI and the state crime labs. Mm -hmm. um, I blame Jerry Beauty. I don't know if he's here. Yeah. <laughs> but the, for, the forensics. <laughs> the mean. forensics. Yeah. I knew nothing about it. I assumed they were like medical labs. And oh my God, what an eye opening. It's horrific. Uh, the, but the second thing is uh, we know the brain isn't fully developed until age 25. Mm -hmm. Yet I see younger and younger children being, like you said, sentenced for life, is there any, uh, is the legal system going to start to listen to science mm -hmm. ever? And, and we've been harping, even Robert Sapolsky out of Stanford is doing some wonderful studies about, um, you know, the prefrontal cortex, impulse right. control, um, right. a judgment. Um, a, a great percentage of people that are incarcerated have uh, brain damage right. or history. And so we are punishing people who have medical problems above and beyond what's considered them. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. So, like I said, this may be too much. No, but it's worth, it's, yeah, very important. Hey, so, uh, we have our own brutal torture chamber in Milwaukee. It's called the, uh, Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility. Uh, inmates are packed in solitary cells. Uh, solitary confinement can run for anywhere from, like, six months to a year and onward. Wardens lie. They say they don't do it. They do. They're bastards. Uh, inmates are locked down for 20 to 23 hours every day, and this place needs to get shut the hell down. We have a campaign. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. We have a campaign to shut down MSDF. It's being led by groups like Expo, Ex Prisoners Organizing. Alan back there can tell you more. Uh, groups like Wisdom, groups like Black and Pink, groups like the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee. My question is for the audience. Now that you know what prison is like, now that you know it's an extension of the most barbaric aspects of white supremacy, what are you gonna do about it? Mm -hmm. Well, that, th that should definitely be our last word. And, I will, and, and so I want, to, I want us to remember that as I, as I certainly walk uh, away from the stage because it, at the end of the day, yes, this is, a, this is as much of a homegrown issue as it is anything. And, these talks are only valuable if they, in fact, inspire people to, to change the horror show that is today. Um, so thank you for that. Um, just really quickly, uh, the question, which I'm very grateful for, which is about the political education going on in the prison and political activists like George Jackson. If you read my book, you'll, you'll read all about that. It's an incredibly important part of the story. It is uh, the part I spend a lot of time on. George Jackson was one of those freedom fighters, uh, many of whom we have today in today's prison, who refused to just accept 
that this system was just and wrote about it. The title of my book is Blood in the Water. And part of that is a quote from a prisoner who says when he looked up in this carnage, all he could see was blood in the water. But I chose it deliberately uh, as to resonate with George Jackson's blood in my eye because that the prison writings of uh, people surviving this hell that was prison were critically important to turning what was that riot into one of the most important human rights rebellions. That is the political organizing that had gone on ahead of time that gave a, you know, a real cohesion and a real logic to the, the mobilization that became the Attica Rebellion. So, so thank you for that. Um, and the repression that George Jackson certainly experienced, namely that he was shot to death. Uh, in his prison uh, mobilized many of the Attica prisoners to not believe that this was risk-free, certainly, to stand up and to know uh, when the state was going to come in that they very likely risked their lives. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and finally, the medical thing. Look, we know the science. Any middle-class educated and working-class educated person knows that young people have issues with brain development that, that, that should be taken into account. And the only time we take it into account is if we have the money to pay for the psychologist and to pay for the certain defense lawyer. We have to start matching the science with the reality of prosecution in this country. And it's never going to happen until we see all children as our children, meaning we are not going to be a racist society indefinitely. Um, Everybody knows that children's brains are not developed. The question is, why do we not care about some people's children? So uh, we, we got the science. We need to work on the humanity, I think. Thank you. Thank you.